Good evening here in New York and on the East Coast. Ohio Gozaimasu, all of you in Japan, you are in for a real treat today as we talk about Asia's geopolitical landscape, China's rise, and U.S.-Japan relations. I can't think of a more topical conversation here at Japan Society. I probably should have started by introducing myself. I'm Joshua Walker, president of Japan Society. Uh, today's topic is particularly uh, topical as we think about President Biden's uh, visit out to the region in the next couple of weeks. There's been a lot going on in the world recently. But before I introduce the topic, I want to just on a very serious and sad note, uh, recognize two giants that we've lost in the last couple of weeks. One here in the United States, Secretary Norm Mineta, uh, who obviously uh, was a giant in the field. He also uh, was very uh, influential in the U.S.-Japan space and here at Japan Society. We lost him last week. And just today we learned of the tragic passing of a very close friend to myself and to many of us at Japan Society and everyone here, uh, Professor Toshi Nakayama of Keio University, uh, who was only 55 years old and leaves behind his family. So uh, our heartfelt condolences uh, to the loss of these two giants. In some ways, what we're talking about today picks up exactly on the legacy of both Secretary Mineta and Professor Nakayama. Talking about what's been going on in the world in the last couple of months, Obviously, the present conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia, the war that has been going on for the last two and a half months, uh, continuing to think about the re reverberations and what the geopolitical climate and what the mood is, both uh, in that region of conflict in, in Europe, but also more broadly in the Eurasian sphere, particularly in Asia, and how China's growing influence and how leaders in China are watching what President Putin is doing very carefully. How does this all this current uncertainty affect U.S.-Japan relations, particularly with elections on the horizon, both in Japan and the midterms here in the United States? And what are the priorities for the U.S.-Japan alliance? I can't think of a better panel than today. My job is to simply thank all of uh, our sponsors for today's business and policy program, our global leaders with Citi, our global partners, uh, Deloitte, Mizuho, Americas, Toyota Motor of North America. So with that, my job is simple, handing it over to our moderator of the evening. Uh, let me introduce you to Takako uh, Hikotani, who's no stranger to those of us in New York as she was at Columbia for a very long time, but she's now a professor at Gakushuin University at the International Center. She's also a visiting professor of the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California at San Diego, where she just returned, but is back in Tokyo. So Hikutani Sensei, let me hand it over to you and thank you for moderating this excellent discussion today. Um, thank you, Josh, for this wonderful opportunity to moderate today. Um, hi, I'm Takako Hikotani, professor at um, Gakushin University. It is a great pleasure and honor to moderate this distinguished panel this morning. Um, and um, I would like to um, not spend too much time with introductions because there should be a lot of questions that we need to cover in the short time that we have. But um, this present conflict between Ukraine and Russia is altering the global geopolitical landscape and bring about major shift in relations between Russia and Western, Western nations. At the same time, as China's influence continues to grow in Asia and around the world, US-China relations are increasingly strained and Japan-US alliance is impacted by the changes in relation between the two countries as well. What are the steps going forward and what should we, how should we think about the region and also the future of the alliance itself, but also the future of Taiwan and other neighboring countries around us? To discuss this topic, we are very honored um, to um, invite the best two people that we can think of, um, and Dr. Um, Joseph Nye and uh, Mr. Nabukatsu Kanehara. Um, Dr. Nye is no stranger to anybody, either in Japan and the US. Um, he is University Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus and former Dean of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Um, he received his bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, from Princeton and won a Rose scholarship to Oxford and, and earned a PhD in political science from Harvard. He has served as Assistant Secretary for Defense for International Security Affairs, Chair of the National Intelligence Council and Deputy Undersecretary of State. In Japan, he is known as the, um, the initiator of the NAI initiative, um, as well as he, his textbook, um, Understanding Global Conflict and Cooperation, an introduction to theory and history, which has gone into its 10th edition, um, has been translated in Japanese and has been a textbook for many students in Japan who study international relations. Many of his other books are also translated into Japanese and widely read in Japan. Um, Mr. Nobukatsu Kanehara served as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe from 2012 to 2019. In 2013, Mr. Kanehara also became the inaugural Deputy Secretary General 
of the National Security Secretariat, a role he held until his retirement from government, um, from service in 2019. He also served as Deputy Director of Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office. Uh, Mr. Kanehana's role in the cabinet built upon a distinguished career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he served in a number of notable positions, including Director General of Bureau of International Law, Deputy Director General of the Foreign Policy Bureau, Ambassador in Charge of the United Nations and Human Rights, and he also served in the Republic of Korea and in the Embassy of Japan in Washington. Uh, if, Professor Nai is an academic, but also a policy practitioner. Uh, Mr. Kanehara is a practitioner with, um, with um, deep, hist deep historical knowledge and academic contributions. Especially recently, he has been a prolific author of many books, um, including Japan's Grand Strategy Towards China, which um, he published in 2021, and um, has been um, publishing a couple of very interesting roundtable books, um, including one published recently titled Let's Talk Frankly About Nuclear Weapons. Um, and so today we would like to try to talk frankly about nuclear weapons and Japan's grand strategy with China in a very frank mode, if possible. Um, and from here, I'd like to start our discussion. I'm sure um, everybody would first like to hear the two experts' assessments of what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and how that is affecting the region. Um, has, what has changed and what has not changed since the Ukraine war with regards to the region? How are the Asia strategic landscape changing in response to what we have seen unfold before our eyes um, since February? Um, Doctor and I, may I start with you? Thank you. Well, uh, February 24th and in the invasion of Ukraine was a turning point in the agenda of world politics in the sense that what people were thinking and talking about uh, a month earlier changed quite dramatically. Um, in Europe, uh, this was clear if you look at the policy of Germany, where the Americans have been trying to persuade the Germans to uh, give up on the North Stream 2 pipeline and to increase defense spending to 2% of GDP. And Germans had dragged their heels on this for a long time. Uh, Putin was able to reverse that overnight. Um, you had a, an extraordinary change in German policy. And NATO, which Pre President Macron of France had claimed was brain dead two years ago, has had a surprising revival and coherence. It, people have stuck together. And in Asia, uh, it, it's less impressive in terms of, of countries like India, which is trying to balance different interests. But I was struck uh, actually by Kitani san your article about how powerful the impact of the Ukraine invasion was on Japan. Uh, instead of hoping that you would get the Northern Islands back by being nice to Putin, basically uh, Japanese attitudes changed dramatically as well. So I think you could say that um, February 24th was a, was a changing uh, turning point in the agenda of world politics. Um, I would also argue that it, it has had a net beneficial effect for American power and a net negative effect for uh, uh, Russian and, and Chinese power. Uh, Member Xi Jinping was speaking about, uh, in January, was speaking about uh, the east wind prevailing over the west wind. I don't think people think that's uh, a particularly good slogan anymore. So I think it's been a major change. Thank you, Dr. Nye. Thank you so much for the kind reference to my article. Um, uh, Mr. Kanehara, um, I'm actually pretty surprised by the level of impact this crisis has had in Japan. Uh, what is your assessment so far about how the crisis have changed um, the geopolitical landscape in Asia and possibly um, the level of uh, public opinion in Japan. Europeans and Americans tend to forget that Japan is a neighbor to, to the Russians. We have a long border with them. And we fought two wars against them. And we know how brutal they were in the time of the, uh, the, 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 the warfare. Um, the, there are several lessons that the that Japanese took from this, this war. One is the P5 member, the nuclear states, uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, power states the Russia just violated black and white way 
United Nations Charter and invaded Ukraine. And the, the basic difference of stances is very, very, very stark here. Russia sticks to 19th century power politics. This is my vassal. This is my territory. This is my sphere of influence. This is my woman. Don't touch her. That's what she, he's, say, he's saying. Our response is her, her free will is they, they don't like you. <laughs> this, is, this is our message. Ukraine does not like you. So we have to respect her free will. This is our basic stance. So there are no, no, no concessions on our side as far as Zelensky is ready to fight. We're going to help him. This, this is one. Two, the, this war just destroys the sort of myth of P5 nations to sustain the post-war world of peace. And this is over because P5 member just destroys the United Nations Charter. On the contrary, amazingly, the Mr. Biden successful in uniting again the West. It, it's amazing that Japan, Germany, Italy, together with the French and Americans and the German, the, the British, we, we, are, we are in a warfare. These G5, G7 nations are for economic affairs, but now G7 nations are united to face Russian invasion. And this is a basic, uh, basic shift over the politics. And in this way, the West must be united to push back Putin's ambition. One big, one big wake, wake up call for the Japanese is nuclear weapons. For many Japanese, nuclear weapons are the last resort. Until the P5 nations kill each other by massive nuclear uh, attack, uh, there won't be any use of nuclear weapons. But there are very small scale nuclear weapons. B61 of the Americans is smaller, could be smaller than Hiroshima type nuclear weapons. And Putin has many of these kinds of small nuclear weapons. And he said, the, he said, I might be, I might be using these nu nuclear weapons at the very early stage to show my resolve to de-escalate. I'm going to escalate nuclear warfare. Okay, this, this was theoretical until he said this this time, and suddenly this became very, very, uh, very serious. Suddenly, nuclear weapons became a very cheap instrument of blackmailing. This never happened before. Now it's a reality. The Japanese start to think that if Xi Jinping does the same thing, it's the same thing in Taiwan contingency, what would happen? Okay, this is now very real question for, for many Japanese. Uh, Japan is ready to Amer let the Americans use Japanese bases to defend Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. This is a deal cut in 1960. In 1990s, when Soviets gone and the North Koreans started to develop nuclear weapons, Americans asked us to help them. So Obuchi, then prime minister, gave a new legal authority to SDF to help Americans in non-combat non operations in the, in the vicinity of Japan. It's in 1990s. In this century, when China became too big, Abe-san, Prime Minister, changed the inter interpretation of the Constitution. He gave new authority to SDF to help Americans in combat operations in the vicinity of Japan. So Japan is now ready to fight together with Americans in Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And then the Putin did this. So we're now asking if Xi Jinping tells us, don't move your forces, Japanese self-defense forces, to help Americans. Otherwise, you will be, be shot by Chinese tactical nuclear weapons. If China says that, how can we cope with that? We, we have to ask Americans to say something, to say something. Americans will say, Japan will be covered totally by nuclear umbrella of the United States. And for us, of course, US forces in Japan are the ultimate guarantee for us. They, they die together with us. But if Yonakuni Islands, the very close to Taiwan, are 100, 100 kilometers from Taiwan and, and guarded only by the, our army, if that is blown as a signal, as a determination of China, what would happen? Now, this kind of thing is very real for Japanese. So Abe-san started to say, we have to think of nuclear sharing with the United States. Abe-san also said, we have to ask Americans to abandon ambiguity policy to defend or not Taiwan, and we have to show our resolve. The one, one thing is very clear. If the Taiwan contingency happens, anyway, the United States will win even far stronger. But if, if the United States wins, when the United States wins, have a good, good ceasefire with China, 
with Japan destroyed by nuclear weapons. This is not what we want. What we want is to deal with Chinese 100%. How to do that? This debate is now has now become very very serious and very real in Tokyo. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Karahara. Um, so, Doctor and I, um, it is true that um, the policies that um, discussion in Japan has changed quite a bit, um, especially um, led by um, statements by Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe. Um, back in February in a TV program, and also then um, in Project Syndicate in, um, two th in on uh, April 12th, where he calls for an end to strategic ambiguity over Taiwan. And also he has discussed, as uh, Mr. Kanehara just did, the possibility of nuclear sharing, uh, or at least starting the discussion of nuclear sharing between Japan and United States. Um, so if we can start with the latter point about the nuclear weapons, um, if we are to try to go back a little bit to the Ukraine crisis that we started, how worried are you about the sort of escalation and what state of affairs with um, nuclear weapons in general in today's world? And what do you think should be Japan's step way forward on this issue? Thank you. So let me start with the nuclear question. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> some people say that Ukraine should never have given up its nuclear weapons uh, back in 94. Uh, and if it hadn't given up its nuclear weapons, it would have been safe from Russia. I think that oversimplifies history. It assumes that the type of nuclear weapons that Ukraine would have inherited from the Soviet Union uh, would have been useful, which they wouldn't have been at that stage, and uh, that the Russians would have stood by while Ukraine developed usable uh, nuclear weapons. I think that's very unlikely. As countries think of where they are on nuclear weapons to where they'd like to be, uh, they go through what I call a valley of vulnerability. In other words, they make themselves less secure rather than more secure as they try to make that step. And I think Ukraine uh, would have gone through that valley of vulnerability, whether it would have survived it or not, I kind of doubt it. But the point is that it's one thing to talk about nuclear sharing between the US and Japan, Another thing to talk about the processes in which you make change. I agree with Kanahara san that, that uh, Prime Minister Abe made important changes in the uh, interpretation of the Japanese constitution, which basically increased the capacity for Japan for self-defense. Uh, I'm a little less impressed by the recent statements about nuclear sharing. The real guarantee for Japan is that uh, you mentioned this is the presence of American troops. Basically, what you have is what I call a community of fate. If North Korea or China were to attack uh, Japanese bases where American troops are stationed, uh, the Americans would be deeply involved right away. And in that sense, uh, when you look back on the experience with nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, people used to say, well, uh, unless we have the multilateral force sharing nuclear weapons, which was discussed with the Germans in the 1960s, we'll never be able to defend Berlin. Well, we never developed that multilateral force, but we did in fact defend Berlin successfully. And what Key, the key to that defense of Berlin was the presence of American troops in Berlin. The Soviets couldn't have taken Berlin without killing Americans. That would immediately have involved us in that community of fate that I referred to. So I think the right way to think about um, the nuclear umbrella is to think of it as this community of fate. And I was impressed, for example, that when President Obama visited Japan uh, in the toward the end of his administration, uh, he made clear that Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty covered the Senkaku Islands. Uh, so I think that's the direction which we want to uh, improve our capacity to deter both China and North Korea, which is to make it clear that you cannot attack Japan without attacking the U.S. And if you do so, that's the end of your regime. 
Thank you, Dr. Nai. Um, Mr. Kanehara, in what respect do you think that the current arrangement or recognition or reform, reformation of the nuclear umbrella to be not assuring enough or reassuring enough for Japan? And we need to take another step towards uh, a nuclear sharing type of arrangement. Could you elaborate? Uh, up to today, the Japan security environment was far better than the European one. In 1950s, 60s, Europeans are facing massive and banned its Red Army, many tanks, and the nuclear weapons were massively brought into West Germany, and French and British were rearming themselves from nuclear with nuclear weapons. Americans are pointing at the Soviet targets or the Arctic Sea. And Far East, we had 400,000 400, Russian army, but we never believed that they would fight a war alone against Japan. So NATO side was very solidly defended, and nuclear weapons are fully ready across the Antarctic Sea, Arctic Sea. So we have we are the second front, and in 1970s China came to us. So we never thought that there would be a World War Three using nuclear weapons. It was basic feeling of Japanese for many years. Now it suddenly changed. Taiwan is the real issue. Maybe 10 years later, this could happen. And Ch China's, China is not like big bear of Russia. China is a short dragon. That tail cannot be seen by the Europeans. And their China is now defended by the Siberian frozen space, the Gobi Desert and Himalayan mountains. So they can attack the east sides along with their full power, and that's only Japan, the United States, who have to face, face that. Uh, can we do that? Can we do the Chinese? If this is new thinking, and China has full nuclear weapons, they might reach 1,000 one, 1, we, 1, weapons in coming 10 years. They are digging out a huge silos now. They want to be our equal partner in the nuclear field with the United States. And they might use these nuclear weapons in blackmailing if the Taiwan contingency happens, how to cope with it, the key. We, this this, this uh, deterrence issue is not only a military calculation. This is not only for uh, the military uh, experts. This is for the president and the prime minister. And they have to persuade the people. This is very much psychology. Are we safe? Japanese asked the prime minister, are we safe, sir? If Xi Jinping said, if, SDF helps American forces in Taiwan. Okay, Ch China will punish Japan with nuclear weapons. What can our prime minister say to the people? Believe me, no, he can't. He can never say that. He can never say that. So, and um, would he say the president Biden assured me? So believe me, can he say that? He can never say that. He needs something to present to the people. Believe me, this is what I got from Americans. I believe Americans fully. What are these things? Of course, we can say we have American forces here. That's their commitment. If the if the if the colleagues are killed, American military will never allow the enemy. So they will destroy enemy with the nuclear weapons. This is what we can say. But if Xi Jinping is smart enough, if he rips off small bases near Taiwan, like Yonaguni, Shigaki, and these Sakshima Islands, with using the uh, tactical small nuclear weapons, the answer is blurred. We can't have a we, we can't have a good answer, but the, if the uh, prime minister caves in in blackmail in blackmailing by by China, Japan U.S. alliance would be dead. So we can't we can't allow that. So we have to be prepared for doing something. How to enhance Japan's Japan's original nuclear weapons is not an option. Nobody's talking about that. But Japan is now, the, some politicians are talking about the, is there any shape of, any ways of nuclear sharing, even symbolically, like in, in Germany? But my response is this, uh, sir, we don't need G B B B61 against the Russian, Russian massive tank attack, because we don't have that, we are we're islanders, we don't have that. But if we have nuclear weapons, this should be, this should be uh, in the sea, under the sea. Our very narrow islands, if we put American, American nukes on lands, we have to target each other against Chinese, North Koreans, and Russian nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Instead, we can, we can put the nuclear weapon under the sea. It's much invisible, it's much safer. So there are two ways to do. One is if Americans rehabilitate their intermediate nuclear missiles, 
she launched ones. Now they don't have it now. Mr. Biden said they don't need it. I think it's a mistake. But if he if they rehabilitate sort of a sea launch tomahawk, one thing is they put that again on their nuclear submarines and come, come to Tokyo regularly. And this is to defend, these were to defend their carriers. But if Americans say redefine the, the mission of these missiles, saying that this is to defend Japan, if Japan's, Japan, Japan's bases are destroyed, the enemy's bases can be destroyed too with these nuclear weapons. This is one way to say. So the second way is more drastic. Japan should buy nuclear submarines and they carry American uh, new American sea launch tomahawks, and the Japanese should welcome American crew on the board to make a WT functioning. And if Americans don't mind, we don't mind having a conventional submarines like Israeli and put the American crew in this in this in this narrow, <laughs> dark, narrow hull to live together and to make a WT in the sea launch the nuclear weapons to show that any nuclear attacks from enemy against Japan can invite nuclear attacks from the region in tactical way. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Nai, on the point of China, do you think that, um, change your subject a little bit, do you think that uh, the lessons learned by China from what's happening in Ukraine has made the region more unstable? Or do you think that maybe there are some lessons that China learned that makes the kind of actions that we worried about less likely than not? Like the key question is obviously Taiwan. Um, and there, there'd been a great deal of discussion in Washington and elsewhere about uh, the idea that uh, China might try to resolve the Taiwan issue by an attack sometime in the uh, next few years. I think most people no longer think that's plausible. Uh, if, if Putin, uh, with a land-based army massed along the borders with Ukraine, couldn't succeed, uh, China trying to have an amphibious assault uh, is, I think, has learned the lesson that don't miscalculate here. And if Xi Jinping's major concern is control by the Communist Party and his control of the Communist Party, I can't think of anything that will more certainly guarantee the loss of control in both sides of the party and of his control of it uh, than a failure to accomplish a, uh, an overtaking or overcoming of Taiwanese defenses. So uh, I think Xi Jinping uh, understands that. I think the effect of watching how his uh, partner, uh, Russia, did so poorly uh, in trying to take Kyiv uh, was uh, a lesson for him. And he realized that this effort to take over Taiwan could be a major uh, uh, threat to what he cares about most. Uh, so I think the way to, um, to make sure that we capitalize on this is to increase the efforts to persuade Taiwan to invest in the types of things that actually will make them a, a true porcupine, if you want. Uh, or some others use the analogy, Singapore uses the poison shrimp. Uh, I think if the, if the Taiwanese actually, instead of thinking of prestigious items such as high performance aircraft and submarines, if they actually develop the capacity to defeat amphibious forces and to destroy with widely dispersed missiles, uh, Chinese forces that might be assembling close to or preparing to attack Taiwan, uh, that would be the way to make sure that Xi Jinping feels deterred. I mean, the ultimate deterrent would be uh, the fear that the United States would get involved but the first step of the deterrence is to essentially get Taiwan to make itself more of a porcupine. And you don't do this with fancy equipment, which the Chinese could preempt with missiles. I mean, some of the fancy equipment uh, wouldn't be there after the first uh, surprise strike. On the other hand, um, 
missiles that are hidden in caves or that are mobile and that can essentially maintain sea control uh, against any amphibious forces. Uh, that's the right way to, to uh, enhance deterrence in Taiwan. Um, thank you. And for uh, on, to continue the Taiwan issue, I gather from your previous writings that you are not for increasing strategic clarity on Taiwan, but believe that the current policy um, should be continued. Is that correct, Dr. Knight? Well, the doctrine or practice of strategic ambiguity has been designed to do two things. One is to dissuade the Taiwanese from thinking that if they declared unilaterally independence, that they had an automatic guarantee. And on the other hand, to dissuade the Chinese from thinking that they could use force and get away with it. So the Chinese have, uh, have to think about what would happen if the uh, if the if they attacked Taiwan? Uh, if the China, if the Taiwanese had not declared independence, uh, and I think there's a pretty strong probability that the U.S. would be involved. Uh, Biden's recent statements have uh, have re reaffirmed this, even though they've been cautiously uh, qualified after the. Uh, so I think the I think the purpose of the so-called strategic ambiguity was if what you might call double deterrence to deter uh, Taiwan from declaring independence, which could precipitate a crisis by creating a situation in domestic Chinese politics where Xi Jinping would think that he had to react, or on the other hand, the double deterrence. The other half is to deter. Uh, China from thinking that if it amassed enough forces and could suddenly do a coup de main or fait accompli, they'd wound up in the plus situation like Putin did, where he thought with three days campaign after capturing the airport outside of uh, Kiev, he would overthrow the government in Kiev and have control of the country a little bit like the Soviet Union did in Budapest in 56 or in Prague in 68. I think it, we've got to make it absolutely clear that that option is not available to China. Thank you very much. Um, next to uh, Mr. Kanehara, um, about the porcupine strategy and what Japan should do. I think um, this year is a very, 2022 is a very important year for Japan when the national security strategy is going to be revised and the national defense program guideline um, is going to be drafted. And recently we've seen proposals by the Liberal Democratic Party to enhance Japan's defense um, by, um, incre uh, by increasing the counterattack capability where the South Defense Forces should could, could strike an enemy base believed to have started preparing for an attack against Japan, as such as with ballistic missiles or other military means. Um, they have also pr proposed to increase defense spending at least 2% of the GBT in the next five years. And there seems to be signs that recently the public opinion polls have shown that public is more uh, supportive of that than previous years. And that uh, also some discussions about strike capabilities against an enemy region. Do you think that these proposals are making Japan to be uh, stronger or more vicious Porcupine, or do you think Japan is and or should go beyond being a porcupine to keep itself safe? Well, thank you very much. Um, the since Abe san, the Kishida -san's, Kishida san's strategic orientation is the same as Suga san and Abe san. This is LDP orthodox now, and diplomacy was not, not so bad. It's the four year free open in the Pacific, quads. No one want to join August, but we can do that. <laughs> and to trying to engage Europeans, ASEAN nations. The, the diplomatic strategy was not so bad. The economy to Japan sustaining the TPP without American seats still in, in vacuum, but trying to somehow sustain this Washington standard free trade, not the Beijing standard in, in the region. And anyway, Japan is trying hard to gets the Asia, emerging Asia, into our liberal water, not the West being marginalized on the continent. On the, on the contrary, the West must engulf the emerging East. That, that's the basic thing. The weak point is the military. Japan was very much self 
sustaining. So Japan did not try to expand militarily. In 1970s, Japan was already number two in, in the size of the economy. We said we don't become very big militarily. And since then, stopped thinking. In <laughs> the meantime, China became very big now. China is now three times bigger than us in terms of the economy. The military budget is five times bigger. 2,400 2, fighters, <laughs> that's 350 destroyers. <laughs> this is a monster. This is a monster. This is just like the Imperial Army Navy. During Showa time, nobody can stop them except Americans. And they have clear targets in their minds, that's Taiwan. So we have to be prepared for that. That's only one big possible scenario of warfare in the early 21st century. And Taiwan is too close to us. It's not like North Korea. North Korea, South Korea can deter them. South Korea, the Taiwan, South Taiwan cannot deter Chinese. So the only possible allies in the regions are Americans and Australians and Japanese. Maybe we should engage Koreans, but they are, they are deeply in the box of Peninsula. They can't come out. We have to engage Europeans. It's not so easy. Now we have to be serious about Taiwan contingency. The military budgets, 2% GDP is absolute necessity. It's still less than necessary. We have to attain that in five, six years time, 10% of GDP. Then Japan will be number third big military budget nation on earth, but still far smaller than China had to do that. And the military capability is very much 75 years in, 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 in peace. That make military rotten. We have to we have to rehabilitate our military capabilities. The military is okay, they are training every day, but the government has absolutely no capabilities to fight a war. 75 years under American protection, they lost it, the capabilities. So we have to rehabilitate. Now, these things are seriously debated among the young, among young politicians of LDP. I think it's encouraging, but it, I have said it's just one step forward. We have still go to a long, long way to be ready to deter truly China. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nai, on this point, do you think that um, increasing defense spending in Japan um, could be destabilizing depending on the pace or the way in which done, or do you think it will be more stabilizing? What, what are some concerns you might have? Well, I would uh, favor increasing defense spending in Japan. I, I agree with Kanahara-san. Uh, I thought uh, that Prime Minister Abe did a very good job of bringing Japan into a realistic view of uh, what would be needed for defense. And uh, I think if you look at the progress in the US-Japan uh, alliance, uh, we just made enormous progress over the last 20 years. Uh, and it's step by step, but it has been uh, real progress. I think the next step is a more unified command structure so that if there were a crisis, we'd have better integration of the US and Japanese forces uh, on, a, on a command basis. But I, I, you know, this is one of these things is the glass half full or half empty. I've been struck that the glass used to be close to empty and it's now well above half full. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kanehara, I saw you nodding. When Dr. Lai mentioned um, unified command structure, do you have something to add to that? And um, do you agree with that? Our, our forces were miserable. <laughs> 2006, the SDF has established a joint staff. 2006, amazing, isn't it? It's only in this century. 2018, we created a new post of the chief staff army. Amazing, isn't it? We didn't have that before. We had five core, regional core armies, and there was no one single commander who could command our army. Okay, this is our system. So we have now joint staff and the chief staff army, chief staff navy, chief staff uh, air force. We have this one, but we do not have not yet a, a integrated commander and the headquarter to help this integrated commander. And this makes a big deficiency in the warfare simply because the joint, 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 chief, joint chief staff would must assist prime minister 24 hours because he had to take, take, pick up the call from the, the Boris Johnson or Joe Biden. So the military must su su support him. This is the joint, joint staff chief 
but somebody should 24 hours commands the old warfare. We didn't have this post. We did not have this guy, so we can't fight. So we have to create a joint commander and to support him, we need a big headquarter to sustain 24 hours the operation together with the Americans. Otherwise we can't fight the war. And this organization is lacking in Japan today. We're very angry. We thought five years ago with the Prime Minister Abe, he ordered Defense Ministry to, to be prepared. They didn't do that. And this time for the new defense guideline, the government would push this again to the SDF. This time you should do that. And I, I believe that they're gonna do that. So joint staff will be strengthened and they will come up and then we can truly make a, a good integrated operation with the Americans. Two things are lacking. One is cyber. This is very weak in Japan. Admiral Blair, he was national intelligence a director who came to Tokyo recently, and he said Japan cyber cyber security is minor league. I mean, Japanese said, oh, good. He didn't say little league. <laughs> and space, space also is still very weak. To be free interoperational with the Americans, we have to go much, much further in cyber and in space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the more um, interesting developments, I would say, in addition to the um, bilateral relationship allies being enhanced, is the uh, rise of the Quad. We are expecting a Quad meeting in May 24th um, in Tokyo. Um, and, uh, and also at the level of bilateral relationship, Japan has fortified its relationship uh, militarily with uh, Australia with the signing of the reciprocal um, access agreement and, and, and has taken a step forward with the UK on the same um, issue. So um, Dr. Um, Naya, what is your assessment of the current situation with the Quad? What developments do you think will be helpful? How significant could it be? Um, have the recent um, um, developments with um, India's approach to Ukraine, do you think that might hinder the progress going forward? Um, and also some other groupings, like um, some in Japan have argued that, um, and, and Mr. Panahara has also alluded to Japan's interest um, in being part of um, AUKUS and possibly becoming a JOKUS. Uh, what are your views on these regional arrangements to, um, developing over time in the past um, 10 or 20 years? Thank you. Well, I think the Quad is important, but we have to realize its limitations. Um, India ha has for a long time tried to balance uh, 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 Russia uh, relations in the sense of being critical and actually getting more American defense equipment than it had in the past, but it's still heavily dependent both on Russian defense equipment in the past. And also um, it is worried about China more than anything else. And uh, it doesn't want to see China and Pakistan getting even closer. And in that sense, uh, it doesn't want to antagonize Russia. So if you understand Indian behavior as uh, trying to make this balancing act, it explains why the Indians have not uh, come out more frontally in their criticism of, of Russia and the invasion of Ukraine. On the other hand, I've, I've, I've been involved for 20 years in a strategic dialogue with Indians. It's a track two or non-governmental group that Brent Scrocroft and I had started with uh, Indian counterparts. And what struck me is that when you talk to Indians about their strategic questions, um, once you got away from the formal talks across the table with the little flags on the green uh, uh, beige covers, um, and you started talking about what they really thought about China, they were scared of China and they didn't want to antagonize China, but they definitely wanted to improve the capability to uh, deter China. That's evolved in the sense that originally the Indians were very scared to do much with uh, the Quad because it would uh, antagonize China. Uh, the fact that they now are willing to meet formally uh, with Japan and Australia and the US is a huge step forward. And I think it's going to continue to evolve in a positive direction, but we shouldn't think of, of, of uh, trying to push it into a formal defense alliance. The Indians aren't 
ready for that yet. Um, but it certainly is evolving in the right direction. As for uh, Japan, um, I think, you know, having Japan participate in AUKUS, that would make sense. It would also help a lot if Japan and Korea would uh, overcome some of these disputes about the past. It's, it's crazy for Japan and Korea to be wrapped up in the history of the 1930s when the real problem in the 2020s is a nuclear North Korea and an expanding China. And the idea of the Japan and Korea and the US are not doing more and better in our joint defense cooperation is, uh, is a case of which the past has overwhelmed the future. So of uh, 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 various, I'd love to see Japan and AUKUS. I'd also like to see Japan repair the relationships with South Korea. Not easily done, but perhaps with this new administration, uh, it'll be steps that can be taken. Um, thank you for um, um, your comments and raising the, um, the topic of Korea. Um, it is very relevant today because Foreign Minister Hayashi is in Korea right now um, to um, attend the inauguration. Um, and that we are hopeful that uh, recent statements by the Korean government could be a way forward for a more uh, constructive relationship. So on that note about Korea and also for about um, Quad and, um, and um, possibly Jokas, we have received questions on that topic too. So Mr. Kanehara, would you uh, share with us your views on the, prog on the future of these arrangements? Yeah, thank you very much. Quad, quad, is, quad is important, but th this is not for short term uh, policy. This is a long, long term investment. In India is not half the size of Japan in terms of economy, very, very rapid. By 2035, they will surpass us. So after we, by 2040, Japan will be number four on Earth as an economy, a very silver heading society. So we have to invest in, in India. There are two, way, two, two, two ways to understand that. One is the, of course, narrative. That is the nation created by Gandhi and created by Nehru and a born democracy. And they kicked out the yoke of British colonial, colonial, colonial rule by nonviolence. And the Gandhi's thinking affected, of course, gave good influence in, 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 in Reverend King and pulled down the, the racial discrimination in, in the United States. And these things are, these narratives are very important to understand our liberal international order. So India is back to us, is, is, is very much welcome. A second is India is now the, the only one possible strategic weight to counterweight China towards the latter half of the century. We have to engage them anyhow. And so far it's successful, but we have to think that takes time because in 1962, China invaded India just after uh, Nehru invi invited Chu and I in Bangtung, the Mao stabbed the back of Nehru. Nehru is very angry. Indians are very, very angry. But after that, 10 years later, we kissed the cheek of Mao and, and rapprochement Japan, Japan, China, and US China were allies. Indians wept for that. We have democracy here. And Mao is the greatest killer of last century. We took, the, we took, took his hands to face the Russians. This is what happens. And Indians don't forget that. And now we need Indians. And Indians understand that. They are coming towards us, but slowly. They are buying many uh, weapons from Russia. And Rus for Russia, India is more comfortable than China. But now India is taking distance with Russia. Russia is angry for that. But this is a trend that we have pushed forward. We have taken in India. And with China, relationship is becoming a bit tense. And this is new strategic change. The future framework of this century is the G7 plus India plus Australia, Japan, Korea, and ASEAN possibly, and China. And Russia is falling very quickly. This is what's happening today. And we have to consolidate this new strategic framework. <clears throat> and Korea, the, well, I have said that the Japan helped Koreans a lot since their independence, even before it, colonial rule. Under Japanese colonial rule, their, their population was 30 million. When we left, the population was 25 million. And 2 million Koreans are working in Japan, 1 million China, 1 million in Manchuria. 29 million were Koreans. And our rule was, in the first phase, brutal. But the economic expansion phase, we are successful. 
And that, that is the basis of this Korean modernity. And the Park chung hee was the Japanese West Point graduate. He became Japanese librarian and free. And that's the reason why, again, the Korea was successful in building a new nation. Problem is that the after democratization, ideological debate started inside Korea. And they cannot get out of this Korean Peninsula ideological box to think about the vision and to think about their regional responsibility. We're trying to help him. 65, when the Japan uh, normalized relationship with them, we gave them two years, two years, two years budget, and they made the POSCO. And they became very successful for that. In 1990s, Japan swore to lend our forces in non-combat operations in the Korean Peninsula contingency. In several years ago, Prime Minister Abe even said that we can engage forces in combat operations in the vicinity of Japan. We're always helping the strengthening the regional security framework. And we're very happy if Korea joins these efforts, but still, they're still very much in the peninsula box. So we have to put Korea out of this peninsula box and make them responsible for the region because simply because their military budget today is as big as Japan. That means as big as UK, France, and West and Germany. It's a very big military budget, 600,000 army. Navy is expanding. And their, their economic size is as big as Russia today, the G, G10 or 9. They're competing with Russians and Canadians. So they are fully entitled to join G7. Problem is that the Cold War uh, internal politics structure is identical in Japan and in Korea, and they are influenced against the influence each other. I have said our leftists, they are they are very much talking about the uh, wartime crimes and the colonization, etc. They are now in their in their 80s, late 70s. They found a new friends in Korea, Korean leftists. Now they are in their 40s and 50s. They pass over old material. And this is the cooperation of leftists between Japan and South Korea. And this is real. And they are not attacking the each, each, each nation. They are attacking their own conservatives. But this domestic debate spill over the diplomatic fronts. And when the leftists are in power in Seoul, we have great difficulties, Nam Hyun and Moon Jae-in. Kim Dae-jung was OK. He was very respected in Japan. Even back, Hakune, and we had no, no big difficulties. We could adjust because conservatives were adjusting each other. Public mood is very much leftist in Korea. It's just like 1970s in Japan. In 1970s, we can nobody can, nobody can say that we are, I'm pro Americans, Americans, I'm pro Alliance. It's the same thing in Korea. It's very difficult to say I'm pro Japan in Seoul, but it's 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 limited. It's it's only among the leftists. And it's generational change is necessary, but youngsters are very different. I'm teaching kids, the Korean kids, 20s, a very different, much broader insights, very confident, absolutely no inferior complex against Japan because Samsung defeated Sony. And they are very international. And they are talking about the status of Korea, responsibility of Korea in global affairs. Korea is getting matured, but it takes time. But it's coming, it's coming up. If Korea joins the West in the in the region, I have to say even in number, Japan, South Korea, and the United States, Australia, we can outnumber PLA. So if we are united, it's much easier. No, this is what we have to do. But the problem is the ideological shift of the leftists of Korea. They are still saying that it's not on, it's not only only against Japan, they are still saying that's the anti-American imperialism. Demonstrations not only in front of Japanese embassy, it's also in the American embassy too. But we have we can put Korea from this ideological peninsula box. And if they are become if they become the member of responsible partner in the Far East, we can certainly manage Chinese rise. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Kanehara. Um, I'd like to turn to the questions from the audience at this point. And the obvious question that uh, um, it comes is um, like the last point you made, Mr. Kanahar, about China. Um, the question is um, goes like this: Aside from the decoupling strategy, is there any way for the West and developed countries to increase the strategic indispensability vis-à-vis -vis China and Russia, democratizing them, deterring any military conflict, and maintaining 
the global norm and order. So Dr. Nai, uh, maybe a word about decoupling and also about the possibilities of um, increasing strategic in indispensability vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Well, in terms of uh, decoupling, there are some areas in technology where we probably should decouple for our defense purposes. Um, the recent example was preventing Huawei from developing uh, fifth generation telecommunications. Uh, you don't want your telecommunications to be controlled by a company which would be holden to the Communist Party in the time of the crisis. So I think that type of decoupling makes sense. On the other hand, a broad decoupling of the economies uh, doesn't make sense. It would be a tremendous shock to the world economy. So as we talk about decoupling, we have to be careful uh, to be very specific about what we mean and what the purposes are. Uh, there was a theory uh, 15, 20 years ago that um, integration to, to China into the World Trade Organization, into the world economy would uh, lead to liberalization in China. Um, that's proved to be disappointing. Uh, Xi Jinping's policy has, if anything, insisted on tighter and tighter party control and some of the early green shoots of independent thinking that we might have seen in the early 2000s have been uh, stamped out. So I think what we need is a, is a realistic appraisal of interdependence with China. It's not like the Cold War because we are much more economically interdependent than we ever were with the Soviet Union. In addition to that, there's ecological interdependence. China is now the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. Uh, that's going to hurt China. It's going to hurt Japan. It's going to hurt the rest of the world, including us. But nobody can solve that acting alone. So in that sense, uh, we're going to need what Kevin Rudd called a, a managed strategic competition, which will allow for some areas of cooperation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're assuming that China is going to uh, transform itself into a democracy in the next decade or two. Thank you, Dr. Nye. Um, Mr. Kanehara, on this point, um, in Japan, there's been discussions, active discussions about precisely this issue and economic security matters with China. Do you think Japan and US are uh, on the same page with regard to decoupling? What are your thoughts about this um, overall? Yeah, I think the, uh, the Professor and I is, is uh, what, I, what I'm going to say is the, the same. So China is not too big. Russia is the size of size of Korea. They, are, they, are, they, feel, they make their weight felt only in the market of oil, gas, and wheat maybe. But it's a tiny economy in comparison with the US or Japan and G7 nations. Ch China is a very big. It's impossible to decouple them. So we have to we have to think of this interdependence seriously. But the business is one, business interest is one, but security is another, and human rights is again another. If China violates massively human rights, if China if China invades Taiwan, we have to bear the cost of business, and it's very heavy. But the, we have to pressure China too. Don't do that because it's it's too costly. And one, one thing is that the, the Russians, Russians want to be respected by force. I'm a strong, I'm a macho, I'm a strong man. That, that's Russia, very much so. China is a bit different. They want to be respected as, as a moral source. And this was their tradition. They are not respected in, in, in Asia as a military power. Mongols and Manchus and Japan trump China very often. But China has been a source of morality in Asia. That's their, that, that was their pride. Mao erased it. Mao introduced Leninist and Stalin style, Stalin style dictatorship. And the Xi Jinping is implementing this brutally. And I, I believe that many Chinese are not happy with this. They want to be everywhere inside this liberal system and want to be respected at the United States. This is what they want. Simply, they do not know how to do it. Money, scattering money, bullying the small ones, can never be the way to be respected. And they have to earn, they have to learn how to be respected. But there are some still hope for the Chinese. We should not think that the Xi Jinping Putin will be will live forever. It's a particular strongman type of leaders. And they might go after Putin with Russia far below, 
in the strat in the in the ladder of international politics, new one could be progressed. And after Xi Jinping, we could have a much a bit smarter uh, West looking leader. And then we should not uh, abandon that kind of hope. Our message is always inclusive, and we have to make them learn that the free will is the basis of legitimacy. And if they can abide by our liberal rules, they are welcome. But it takes time. Meantime, we have to we have to be prepared and not to let them make a big mistake like a war, like in Ukraine in Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time, but I have to. Uh, I, I I really would like to ask um, Dr. Nai for a final word about precisely this topic about. Um, Russia and China and the differences and the leadership. Um, your recent book on the U.S. leadership is Do Moralities Matter? It's somewhat a different question, and yet um, I think there were some important, uh, in interesting points made by Mr. Kanahara. So would you please um, um, share with us your thoughts on this and, and um, as our fi final word? Well, when I wrote the book Do Morals Matter, I was trying to argue that values do have an effect. Sometimes people discount values, but in fact, values can make you attractive and that increases your soft power. And uh, in the short term, hard power usually prevails over short, soft power, but in the long run, soft power makes a big difference. People's minds do matter. So in that sense, I think uh, I agree with Kanahara san that Russia has never paid enough attention to soft power, doesn't understand it, and it uses its hard power in ways that destroys its soft power. China wants soft power. Uh, they do care about the face, if you want, um, but they're not very good at doing it because they have too many conflicts with their neighbors and they insist on tight party control of everything. So uh, I think I, I think Kanahara's son and I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we would like to continue this discussion forever. This has been very interesting and very um, worthwhile discussion, I believe, but we need to end the session right here. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kanehara, Dr. Rai, for joining us today. And thank you very much for everybody in the audience uh, for your participation and for the important question. So thank you very much. I'd like to conclude the session right now. Thank you. <laughs>